Welcome to Fortune Forecast and I'm Daisy. Today I am going to bring you an article by Addington Bruce entitled Stiffening Your Mental Backbone. If you've been following along with my channel, I recently brought to the channel a book titled Your Invisible Power by Genevieve Birand. And she had recommended this article in her book, Chapter 5, Expressions from Beginners. So I scoured the web, I looked and I looked, and lo and behold, there it was. It was published in Good Housekeeping's Magazine, April 1920, their volume 70, number 4. And I want to share with you that I was so excited that I found this article to share with you. It will be a first read for me, so we'll be discovering this together. Sit back, grab your favorite drink, whether it's a glass of wine, cup of coffee, cup of tea, chai, whatever it is. And let's get to it. Stiffening Your Mental Backbone by H. Addington Bruce. Can you do what you want to do? How often do you go to the office with plans all made for the day's work so that you can make every minute count and then some trivial thing upsets the whole schedule and you go home at night with the feeling that the day has been lost? Any man may have that experience occasionally, but every man should guard against its recurrence. Mr. Bruce shows you how to educate your will so you can do whatever you may desire to do. He had gone to a doctor seeking aid for a variety of troubles. Chiefly, he complained of inability to concentrate on his work. Indeed, of inability to concentrate long on anything. My willpower seems to be completely gone, he lamented. Every morning, I tell myself that I will do a good day's work, but every day I fritter and dawdle and idle my time away. I can settle down to nothing, not even to amusing myself. I am restless, uneasy, discontented, and bored. What I want is to be shown how to develop the strength of character that I evidently lack. There must be some way by which I can train myself to work steadily instead of spasmodically and feebly. I want you to teach me how to accomplish this. The doctor smiled sympathetically. You want something else first, he amended. You want about 20 more pounds in weight. Anyone can see from looking at you that you are undernourished. I'll warrant you do not eat anything like what you should. I do not eat very much, that is true, was the acknowledgement. But that is because my appetite is poor. Nevertheless, you must eat. Strip and let me examine you. I must learn exactly what your physical condition is. And after the examination, heart sound, lungs good, nothing organically wrong, but distinct undernutrition. I am going to put you on a liberal diet and I want you to follow it faithfully and to keep out in the open several hours in a day. Come back to me at the end of six weeks and we can then take up the matter of will training. But when the patient next put in his appearance, it was to disclaim emphatically any need for instruction in the development of willpower. I am all right now, he declared, with sparkling eyes and a healthy glow in his cheeks. I enjoy my work and have no trouble in sticking at it. I cannot for the life of me understand why so short a time ago I was so weak-willed. It is very simple, the doctor explained. A short time ago you were lacking in energy because you did not eat properly. Your organism, not being sufficiently nourished, all your faculties, your will included, fatigued quickly. Strength of body and strength of will 
tend to go hand in hand. So true is this that the weak-willed who desire to become strong-willed should always begin by having themselves carefully examined for any possible physical defects. In particular, they should make sure not merely that they're eating adequately, but they are free from defects that might cause malnutrition through interfering with their digestion. As Henry Ward Beecher exclaimed many years ago, it is as difficult for a dyspeptic to enter the kingdom of heaven as for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Or, in the more recent declaration of the psychologist Swift, the will depends hardly less upon the stomach than upon the brain. Let anything be present to affect harmfully the workings of the stomach, and a tremendous handicap is at once imposed on the will. Which means that the candidate for will development should guard against overeating as sedulously as against undereating. Also, that he should extend his exploratory physical examination to include not only the condition of his internal organs, but also of his teeth and his eyes. Dental issue and eye strain affect the will detrimentally, both by causing digestive weakness and by producing a state of chronic nerve irritation. There are thousands of weak-willed persons who, without knowing it, have their willpower seriously limited by precisely the conditions found in the case of certain middle-aged women of so irresolute, unstable a character that it was thought her mind was diseased. Yet, to quote from the report of the physician to whom she was finally taken for an examination, no mental stress or shock of any kind could be discovered in her history. There had been no mental trouble in her family on either side, except for the insanity of a grandmother. The patient had seven brothers and sisters who, with her mother, were healthy, and on examining no physical disease could be discovered, except that her teeth were in a bad condition. The event proved that this was of itself enough to account for her defects of will and her mental confusion. Subjected to radical dental treatment for the removal of abscessed teeth and an improved condition of her mouth generally, a few weeks saw her mentality and her character markedly improved. She now could and did live up to good resolutions and was transformed from a useless and burdensome to a useful and efficient member of society. Next section, Muscular Exercise for the Weak-Willed. What is specially needed by a weak-willed person may be muscular exercise. Even in the absence of any specific condition of disease, the will is liable to be appreciably weakened if muscular inactivity with resultant muscular flabbiness becomes a rule of life. There is a significant hint to many a weak-willed adult as to the parents of many weak-willed children. In the experience of a preparatory school, student unfavorably remarked by his instructors because of the obvious and extreme weakness of his will. At first, it was thought that his failure to apply himself to his lessons was due to sheer indifference and unwillingness to study. Then, feeble-mindedness was suspected. But one instructor of fortunate discernment, noticed that the boy was as inactive on the playground as in the classroom. Making a physical examination of him, he discovered a degree of muscular weakness in chest and arms and lungs that was appalling. Being a firm believer in the too little appreciated truth that physical strength by a kind of reflex is a prominent factor in mental and moral strength. The instructor took the unhappy youngster in hand, prescribing simple exercises to strengthen the muscles most in need of development. When the long vacation came, he persuaded the boy's parents to send him to a summer camp, from which he returned home a different boy in character, in attitude toward his work and 
in his every thought. That fall, the Willem Weakling went in for football. In the winter, he played basketball, and in the spring, taking up track work, he won the mile race against the school, running his only dangerous competition quite off their feet. Another summer in camp followed, and a triumphant return to the football field. And by this time, the delighted instructor was able to report the boy's moral stamina had become equal to any strain that might be upon it, and his mental powers had regained their normal strength. He actually, once or twice, pushed the brightest boy in the school for first place. Adults, muscularly weak as well as weak of will, can profitably take to heart the lesson of this boy's regeneration. Of course, they cannot or at all events should not undertake muscular upbuilding by the strenuous athletics in which he engaged. But golf is available to them, gymnastics, long and short walks in city streets or across country fields. As their general feeling of well-being increases, self-confidence will grow, the self-confidence which always is essential to efficient willing. And because the gaining of self-confidence is an important feature in all education of the will, the weak-willed who desire to become strong-willed should make it a point not only to tone up their physique, but also to hold themselves in the manly, erect posture unconsciously assumed by all who are self-confident. It is a well-established psychological fact that if one deliberately and persistently assumes the attitude expressive of any particular mental state, he will end up by experiencing that mental state. Look brave and you will feel brave. Look cowardly and you will feel cowardly. Look self-confident and you will feel self-confident. It is important to add in this connection, moreover, that since posture is to no small extent affected by the kind of clothes one wears, those desirous of increasing their willpower will find it worthwhile to give some thought to their clothing. There is in New York, or used to be, a certain institution established as a place of refuge for the homeless and the friendless, the down and outers of the great city. There they could count on food and a night's lodging and a helping hand to find work. Also, their clothes were cleaned and, in particular, if their shoes were run down at the heel, new heels were put on them. A cobbler was kept busy doing this special piece of work, as explained by an official. We want men, when they leave here, to find it easy to stand erect. It is hard for anybody to do this if the heels of his shoes are worn away. Standing erect, the unfortunates for whom we care will feel more like real men and will be more apt to behave like real men. Next section, Clothing Influences the Will. The will-less everywhere, please take notice. This was no whimsical theory. Extended to the problem of clothes in general. Avoid clothes that by their tightness make the erect attitude difficult and that lower the bodily tone by disturbing the circulation of the blood. On the opposite side, avoid clothes so loose and ill-fitting as to cause a general feeling of slouchiness reflected in an attitude of slouchiness. And keep your clothes as fresh and neat and clean as possible. Shabby clothes engender mean sentiments ideas of weakness which may directly contribute to weakness of will. To be sure, the clothing may be all that it ought to be, the posture perfect, the muscular system well developed, and the organism free from disease. Yet weakness of will be present. Under the best physical conditions, the will is bound to be weak unless the mind is animated by an earnest, fervent wish to achieve. This is the one absolute indispensable in the education of the will. As a man wishes, so he wills. If he wishes feebly, he wills feebly. If his wishes are of an inferior sort, 
his willpower will be directed to the ignoble ends. By all means, then, improve your physique as an aid in will-building. But over and above this, give thought to your dominant desires. You can never will worthily if you wish unworthily. And how is unworthy wishing to be transformed into worthy? Will energizing wishing. Partly by a special yet simple self-discipline. Partly by changing one's environment in a few but vastly important respects. Let me illustrate concretely. To a physician who specialized in the treatment of laziness, that is to say, the treatment of persons weak in the will to work, there came one day a young man bemoaning his great weakness in this respect. So far as the physician could find, there was nothing the matter with his health. His muscles were in first-class condition. He was well-dressed and he carried himself well. Yet he frankly admitted that for some unknown reason he found his work exceedingly tedious and tiring and did not carry on at it with any noticeable diligence, said the physician to him in effect. It is no difficult matter to make a diagnosis of your case. The trouble simply is that you are not so interested in your work as you ought to be. It may be, of course, that you have selected work not in keeping with your natural aptitudes, work for which you are so ill-adapted that you can never take real pleasure in it. The likelihood is, however, that you have merely failed to cultivate any lively interest in it and have consciously or unconsciously cultivated interests which interfere with the development of the love of work vital to the will to work. These other interests retain their hold on you chiefly because of factors in your surroundings from which you must free yourself as first step in will building. What is the character of the persons with whom you habitually associate most intimately during or outside of your working hours? It is almost a certainty that, as regards the will to work, they are weaklings, as you say you are. It can hardly be otherwise, for if it were your custom to associate with work enthusiasts, you would surely be more of a work enthusiast yourself. Next section. Choose associates you can admire. Psychic contagion is one of the strongest forces in the world, and the tendency of all men is to think and feel and wish and act according to the thoughts and feelings, wishes and actions of their social group. If, then, you are ever to gain the will to work, you must make it a rule to avoid constant association with work dodgers. They may be uncommonly congenial associates, no doubt they are, in your present state of mind. But understand well that if you keep up your intimacy with them, it is useless for you to hope to develop any marked will to work. They will hold you in their prison of sloth and apathy. Nor is it enough to break these intimacies, no matter how agreeable they may be. You need to put yourself much in the company of work enthusiasts. If you cannot find such among your daily working companions, seek them outside your place of work. Cease giving all your leisure to time-killing, pleasure-seeking, or vapid inactivity. Join a club or night class where once or twice a week you will hear serious subjects discussed by earnest people. Their earnestness will be contagious to you just as the mental inertia of the lazy and the frivolous has been contagious in the past. And form the habit of devoting a few minutes every day to thinking about your work in a large, broad, imaginative way. Try to see it 
for what it assuredly is, a vital necessity to yourself and a useful service to society. Balance its advantages and possibilities against its seeming irksomeness, which has been holding so disproportionate a place in your mind. View it not merely as an end in itself, but as a means to greater, most desirable ends. This matter of daily meditation, of pondering the rewards which work well done is certain to bring, is of supreme importance to the vitalizing of your wish to work well, hence of your will to work well. The event proved the wisdom of following the course thus mapped out. It is precisely the course which all weak-willed should take. Like begets like. Contact with people of strong character breeds strength of character. Desire grows by meditating on its subject. If in addition, weaknesses in health are corrected and hygienic living habits adopted, the weakest willed man or woman in the world may confidently count on developing a willpower enabling him or her to surmount any obstacle to the realization of the worthy wishes fervently cherished. And this concludes Addington Bruce Stiffening Your Mental Backbone. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed this and this is kind of my little recap. It may or may not be in the order that Bruce may have uh, presented it. The things that are necessary to help us maintain our willpower is really not one fold. It, it appears to be multifaceted and very intricate. While simple, it is more than what meets the eye. Number one, nutrition. So having our bodies feeling good with the nourishment that it needs helps us to function better. And by functioning better, then our state of being has an opportunity to be elevated. Adding to that is the element of exercise. Having strong or a sense of flexibility and musculature to the physique is another sense that allows the will to function better and of course boosting up the confidence. Adding to that is posture. Posture is important as it allows an energy to be transmuted into the body as opposed from being to a slouched posture. And I could attest to that because I know that when I sit or stand taller, I feel a sense of uh, confidence to my own being without having accomplished anything in, the, in that space. So I do agree with that. And I don't know, have you heard that saying? The clothing makes a man or the clothing makes a woman? Think about the times that you've dressed differently, like a casual attire or, you know, just being in your, I don't know, house clothing versus when you go out to a meeting or go out, you know, to different occasions. How do you how do you feel with better fitting clothes versus clothes that just don't feel fit well or are not tailored to you or are not your size? It, it beats you up as far as your confidence. And a state of mind. State of mind is everything, I believe. I know that it's, it says it's a part of it, but definitely I do believe it's a strong component. The state of mind how is your state of mind and how do you get into that state of mind as all these things are weaving into that as well. So additionally, adding to that is the personal hygiene, taking care of, you know, how, how you appear, you groom yourself, your teeth, your hair, you bathing, simple things make you feel confident, right? And cultivating one's passion. Of course, sometimes we are in a profession or a career that we're doing it because it is what we need to do at this moment. But as we develop all these other things and take pride in our hygiene, take pride in our posture, take pride in how we dress, even if we have a uniform to iron it, to wash it, to clean it, and how we groom ourselves, 
help us feel better about what we need to do and help us develop a better state of mind. And as we develop a better state of mind in what we're doing, we're opening up a whole new channel for not only how we see ourselves, but for how others sees us. And then we can move into some of the things and begin to cultivate our passions or make time to do that. And I believe the last one that I wrote down was surrounding ourselves with people that inspire us, people that help us think better about life, about ourselves, and about just in general state of being. So that's my recap. What do you think about my takeaways? Well, I do hope that um, this has brought value to you and to our channel and to our community here. So if you haven't done that yet, hit the like button, leave me a comment, your feedback, subscribe to the channel, and hit that bell so that you will be notified the next time I upload a video.